How is AI reshaping customer experiences and driving modernization across industries? If that is what you want to understand, welcome to this episode 85 of Extra AI, where we are hosting a compelling roundtable discussion with two distinguished experts in the field, Dave Oxtra from Calabrio and Sarah Hertz from Progress. And today, Dave and Sarah will help us unpack the pivotal role AI plays in enhancing customer engagement and streamlining operations. We'll explore innovative strategies, and the latest technologies that are setting new standards for customer experience, customer service, and business efficiency. And a few words, and a few words about Sarah Fertz and uh, Dave Fox. Sarah Fertz leads the technology community relations team at Progress. With more than 20 years in the software development space, she has spent the majority of her career building community, producing events, forging partnerships, and creating content and marketing programs for the ground hunt. She's a mom, a wife, and a woman in tech who is a passionate advocate for equality and diversity. And Dave Hoxtra is the product evangelist at Calabrio. He combines about over two decades of experience in the contact center industry with his rich personal life as a father, a grandfather, bassist, podcast host, and photographer. His journey through various positions in the industry has given him a comprehensive understanding of the tools and challenges faced by customer experience organizations. Dave's role goes beyond promoting products. He's a knowledgeable advisor, sharing insights on industry trends and technological advancements. His unique perspective shared by professional expertise and personal interests allows him to connect meaningfully with others in the field, providing guidance and support in a rapidly evolving industry. As always, you'll find more details at the end of the podcast. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the podcast conversation. All right, uh, welcome back to our Extra AI Podcast Conversations. And today is another AI roundtable. And today we're gonna discuss on the topic of customer experiences, modernization, and a bit of ethical AI as well. And today I've got uh, two guests, uh, Sarah Fats, Director, Technology Communication, Community Relations and Progress. And of course, uh, we also have Dave Oxtra, Product Evangelist from Calabria. Welcome on board, uh, Sarah, and welcome on board, Dave. Thanks. Thank you Thanks for having us. Yeah. So first, I will uh, maybe start with you, Sarah. Uh, could you give a brief uh, background or maybe a personal or a professional story about how you got into AI or what made you get into this uh, sphere of things and I know a lot of things are happening now around AI in general. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you again for having us uh, today. I'm excited to be here. The you know AI is AI has been around for 75 years, right? I mean it's not like it's it's new, but what is new is um, you know generative AI has moved AI into the hands of everyone, right? You know, and so it, it's democratized it in a very big way, similar to the way the smartphone democratized IT. Um, so to talk about how I got into it is actually really, you know, it's, it's a challenge to pinpoint one thing, but I can tell you one of the things that I'm super passionate about right now, and one thing that I know we'll probably talk about later today is this juxtaposition between AI, which is very much a, um, you know, it's a ones and zeros play, it's a numbers play, and the human side of software, right, where we mm -hmm. need to have empathy, we need to have emotion, and how you can actually leverage how, how technology is actually helping aid in that human side of software and, and making technology more accessible and more inclusive uh, to people um, and the things that we have to be thinking about and worried about. So, I mean, I think, you know, there are a million different ways I could talk about how I've personally used AI and, and how it's impacted, you know, impacted my life from small things like trip planning, mm -hmm. you know, to, to broader, you know, um, making tasks easier to use. But I think really the bigger thing for me is just that idea that, that, where we are today with AI is really um, at a, a tipping point to help bring technology and humans even closer. 
Beautiful, beautiful. I like uh, the aspect of uh, the humanness that you've put into this and how you can bring uh, human beings closer to technology and make better things. Yeah, so absolutely. coming to you, Dave, uh, maybe could you give a brief background about your interaction with AI or your experiences, personal or professional story, what have you came up? Yeah, my experience with AI is basically using Amazon Alexa every day. No, I'm just kidding. It's it's more than that. But uh, we, you know, we we uh, to me, uh, AI for me is it's sneaky. It's been very sneaky in our lives, right? Um, it it reminds me of when the internet first started. The first time I opened Netscape Navigator and typed in a few words into some weird search engine called Google that nobody had really heard of, and and then it was like, oh wow, I, I have some information available to me, and then. Your brain thinks of a little bit different way of using it, a little different way of using it. And just like Sarah said, um, I, I don't think I could last five minutes without some sort of internet connectivity in, in my life. Uh, don't try it. If you've ever been on a cruise ship and you don't have internet, your brain short circuits uh, completely while you're on. But uh, and, and that's what AI is going to be very much like. like right now, AI is, is this like chat GPT uh, party trick, kind of a cool little thing. And we're all like, yeah, look, it's cool. I can make like a top 10 list of something neat. And it gives us this little cool thing. And everybody's like, yay. And then, but in like a year from now, we're going to look back and go, oh, wait a minute. Like everything we're doing is using this. And, you know, now that, chat GPT is kind of a part of our lives for about a year. It's finally starting to, businesses are starting to figure out, hmm, this actually used it. And, you know, it's it's sad because I've already gotten to the point, and Sarah, I'm sure you're just like this, and you too, Raghu, as well, where you can open up an article on the internet and you're like, that was written by AI, you know, yeah, and yeah, and it yeah. and it re and, and it reads just like my uh, my freshman college papers. That's how <laughs> that's how uh, how good it is. And so for me, um, we we tend to look at AI very much from the uh, the provider perspective, right? So our our customers um, are using AI to to make them better at helping their customers. And so where we look at it from a perspective of all right, how can uh, how can we automate workflows? How can we make things faster? How can we make things? How can we make it to where where the human experience is more valuable and not less. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the real key of where we need to be with AI at the moment is, yes, AI is going to take care of all. It's like farming equipment, right? Mm -hmm. Back in the day, everything was done by hand. And then someone invented the steam engine. And then someone figured out a way to plow fields using the steam engine. And everybody probably, wait, wait, what about all these people that plow fields? And we don't have to worry about those people anymore. We're in the same boat right now as we get closer. So I'm really excited about what AI is little bit scared, but mostly excited about where it's going. Beautiful, beautiful, amazing uh, background. So, yeah, I think you touched upon many of these aspects about how it is changing our lives and how it is changing our businesses and the way we interact with the technology and other things. So coming to you, Sarah, for me, let, let us get started on this. I know we have... Uh, been interacting in our daily lives and we see that AI is transforming all these enterprises and consumer businesses in different ways. Right. Maybe in the context of customer experiences or ethical AI, which you briefly mentioned, right. what, how do you see AI transforming here and what are what are your thoughts? Right. I think, you know, one of the one of the biggest concerns from human interactions in general, right, whether you're creating a digital experience or not, is the fact that we all have this unconscious bias, right? And um, there is a risk in leveraging AI to help continue to propagate that unconscious bias, but there's also the potential for us from a customer experience perspective to identify that unconscious bias using AI. So flipping the script, right? And, and instead of propagating unconscious bias, it allows us to, to find the unconscious bias that we've built in as humans and that goes back to, you know, that allows us to provide more accessible content, more accessible digital experiences, more inclusive experiences. Um, it allows you to localize content in ways that maybe you hadn't ever done before. Um, and with that, you know, we were able to, again, bring that human side of software closer by leveraging a very non-human technology. Um, and so that to me, you know, again, I think looking at, um, 
we're spending a lot of time thinking about accessibility. We're thinking a lot of, about uh, inclusivity. How are our tools accessible and inclusive, but also how can we enable other people to be accessible and inclusive in their, in their creation of, of their digital experience? So by leveraging AI, you can, again, like I mentioned, mitigate that, some of those risks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Beautiful. I, I completely echo your thoughts on that. Um, so coming to you, Dave, in the same aspect, I know you have been interacting a lot in your enterprise journey or when you're dealing with your customers or your customers' customers, you know that there are a lot of things that you need to take care of when you talk about these different customer experiences. What are some of those current AI innovations or maybe generative AI innovations which are close to your heart or which you think will make or you folks have to focus a bit more on? I think, Sarah, you hit it just absolutely. It, bringing people closer together, like connecting mm -hmm. things. And and so my favorite one, I'll tell you, this just happened to me. Um, I live in the U.S., if you can't tell by my accent. Uh, mm -hmm. and, but I had to go to the other side of the world, into Norway and Denmark and Sweden um, and Finland. And we, we were talking to customers there. And I used AI to automatically translate a video of myself speaking Finnish and my mm -hmm. lips moved like I was speaking Finnish, my teeth and I spoke Finnish. And at the end I asked the audience, how well did that work? And they were like, it was perfect. Like it, it was, <laughs> it, we could, we, if you hadn't told us, we wouldn't have probably even known that you don't speak Finnish. And that's amazing. I mean, and, and so, yes, we can we can we can talk doom and gloom about mm -hmm. oh what about all these translators that are going to lose their jobs and yes we we need to make sure we're very uh, conscious of that and ethical about making sure that we're not just you know cutting wide swaths of jobs and, and removing people's ability to earn a living but from a human perspective i connected with a room full of 100 fins through ai and that is that's amazing. And 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 not only it's not just Finnish, but I did it in Swedish and I did it in Danish. And I don't speak any syllable of those languages, let alone I'm not, you know, I don't know it at all. And so these are the kind of things that um while 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 AI, you know, I heard somebody say uh, a while ago that for every one thing we're afraid of, there are a hundred things that AI is going to benefit us in our lives. But we don't often stop and think about that. Think about the ability for someone to literally pick up the the phone and have a conversation across the globe and never worry about uh, never worried about language barriers ever again. Uh, mm -hmm. never worrying about being able to effectively communicate correctly. Those are, those are things that are disappearing rapidly with AI. And that's, that's what's so exciting about from a personal perspective and our customers' perspectives, right? It's, it's the same idea of being able to eliminate those barriers that, have, that we haven't even thought of yet. Things we just naturally as human beings from day to day spend our time not thinking about because they've been a barrier our entire lives. All of a sudden, that's no longer a barrier. I can I can effectively walk into any store in the world, and as long as I have a smartphone in front of me, I mm -hmm. can communicate now. That that's insane. And so, yeah, sign me up. Sign me up for the AI revolution. Yeah. I, that's where I'd like to go. Dave, you mentioned you mentioned jobs, and I think it's really interesting to think about the fact that you know going back to it's not gloom and doom, right? The mm -hmm. idea is, and you had touched on it a little bit earlier already with your you know your farming example, but. But there are so many opportunities that I think AI is going to afford. There are going to be people, I mean, and I'm not even talking about, you know, prompt engineering, but it's how do you, how do you change? I think there are jobs that we don't even know exist mm -hmm. that 10 years from now, we're going to be like, oh yeah, if it hadn't been for AI, we wouldn't have had this, right? And you're talking about the, the localization quickly. There are still always going to be a need for, for linguistics and, and people who are behind that. So I think, I mean, I... I think it's exciting as well. And I, I agree with you. I don't think it's all gloom and doom. I think it's a little scary to think that that you looked exactly like you were speaking Finnish and Swedish, but I think, you know, there's, um, it's still also, I think the benefit of that, like you said, to be able to communicate with and, and connect with people in a different way is phenomenal. Yeah, Beautiful. Absolutely. So I think this is where, this is where I believe um, we come to see, maybe there are new industries that might even crop up. 
with what of with the different technology or the different innovations that are happening we might think that hey some of these jobs are going to go away but we don't even understand or we don't even we can't even comprehend what other things might open up so staying on that aspect or maybe going a bit on your uh, background i think dave i know i know you have coming from uh, the contact center industry uh, background i think you have been working with, you, you have had some uh, experience in there so maybe could you provide some thoughts about how the landscape of this uh, of customer experience in the contact center industry has evolved over the last two decades and what are the trends that we have noticed and what is happening in there because this is where now a lot of ai might also be impacting in that industry yeah absolutely so the the thing that is growing exponentially is the ability for a customer to self service right so again 20 years ago if i needed to know if I, if i owed the water company uh money and i had to call them and there had to be a human being and i said what's my what how much do i owe you and they would say it's 32 dollars and 75 cents and i'd say thank you and then i'd write a check and then i'd put it in an envelope and i'd mail it right all of those things are gone now we don't do any of those things anymore uh now i simply log on to a website and get or as a matter of fact usually what happens is it just automatically gets charged to my to my account and then i get a nice little email or a text message and i'm done now self service is now starting to evolve to where it's less uh it, it, even the more complex what would have been considered complex 20 years ago is now being completely managed. When I return a package on Amazon, I can do it through a chatbot and the chatbot coordinates the whole thing for me. I don't have a human being. Um, I can now um, I can now cancel orders. I can order things. I can literally speak to a little box in the over here and and have that box order something and deliver it to my house without a human being interacting with anything. And this is the trend that's going to continue to evolve. Now, one of the biggest fears that in our contact center industry is that, again, let's talk about jobs, all of mm -hmm. these agents, all of these human beings that are out there that answer these phone calls, oh, we're just, they're, they're all going to, nobody's going to have a job in two years and five years. I mean, it's been every year, it's been two years or five years that all these people are going to lose their jobs. But what's really interesting is, as we're seeing, is as self-service gets better, the complex issues get more complex. And that's the beauty of it is, is that all it's really doing is shifting the scale of what is self-service. We're not we're not seeing a, a wide elimination of positions, but you know when you have that. Oh, okay, so here's what happened. I got to explain, and I got to talk to the billing department. I got to talk to the, uh, the the finance department. I got to talk. Those complex issues um, are still being handled by humans. But those those humans are now able to dedicate much more time and energy and focus to those complex issues because all of those little piddly ones that are sitting out there are no are being handled by the self service. So that's to me the rapid involvement is how much is now included in being able to self serve, and then but we're still have as just as many complex issues out there, and that's the fun part is we need smarter humans now. We need more critical thinking humans to do these things as opposed to back in the day when we could have 80% of the, you know, what's my account balance? Oh, that's easy. I can do that. There's no more easy when it comes to this kind of stuff. It's all of it's hard and we need, we need smarter people, but we still need people. I had a friend who just recently was talking to me about the same kind of thing, Dave, and she was talking about the concept of humans in the loop, right? So AI aids those, provides enough aid to the, the, the complex scenarios that you're talking about. And pulls the humans in when it when when the generative AI can't take care of it anymore when you need it. So 100% agree with what you're saying, right? Being able to have the human in the loop doesn't mean that humans are gone completely. It just means, like you said, these more complex scenarios become something that are are easier to resolve um, quick, quicker, quicker, which is actually yeah. a wonderful thing when you're talking about customer experience, right? <laughs> yeah, I have a I have a good example of that is. Um, in, in the contact industry, contact center industry, one of the things that we deal with is kind of forecasting volumes, right? So mm -hmm. how many calls are chats are we going to get tomorrow, next week, things like that. And the ability for software to do, to predict that is getting better and better and better. But 
I, it uh, doesn't matter how forward thinking I can go. I still cannot envision a scenario where AI or a computer can say, I need to go back to last Monday, figure out why we got way more calls than we used to. And the reason we got way more calls than we used to is because uh, Janice in marketing accidentally sent a coupon out to 500 of our customers and they all called in and to try and take advantage of the coupon, but we shouldn't have done that. Like that is a 19 step process that I I really will struggle. Now you, we may go back to this, this <laughs> podcast 10 years from now and go, Dave, see, you were totally wrong. You don't have any idea what you're talking about, but that's, that's exactly the kind of stuff that there's, we're still going to need human beings to step through that very complex and, and it all ultimately comes down to understanding human behavior. Your AI, is, AI is going to struggle to understand human behavior for a long, long time. And yeah. we'll, there will always be a place for us. Exactly. Exactly. I completely echo with your thoughts. And I think uh, this is where customer experience comes into mind, right? Like now, mm -hmm. uh, maybe uh, coming to you, Sarah, I think I would like to bring up this aspect of, uh, I know AI is becoming more sophisticated in its capabilities and its understanding of what has to be done all these complex concepts, and we have discussed about this context-centered industry, but how can the developers, they can harness AI to keep this customer experience in mind? Maybe a few thoughts that you would like to provide in that yeah, aspect. Absolutely. I mean, I think probably the first thing is, you know, and we've talked about it, touched on it a couple of times, the idea that, that you can leverage AI to um, to streamline and automate certain tasks, you can take, you know, th that allows you to spend more time on that, on that experience side of things, right? So as a developer, um, there are tools that exist right now. Microsoft obviously has a ton of, you know, Microsoft Copilot. Even within our, our Sitefinity CMS tool, we have tools that allow you to um, leverage AI to, to create and optimize pages, you know, with a click of a button, basically. But um, what that does is allows you to, to focus on on different things, right? So you can think about what does make this a better experience for, for my customer? What is this, you know, and, and so if you're thinking about app logic and you don't have to focus on, on um, just the core base of the code, right? You can think about how can I, how can I make this more sophisticated without adding more complexity, right? Which is also, you know, the more complex we become on the back end should provide a more simple and, and intuitive interface for our customers on the front end. Um, and so, you know, there are, it's exciting to me, the, the tools that are available today, um, even people playing around with, with just chat GPT, not, not the co-pilot mm -hmm. portion of things, but um, you know, you can, it, it does a pretty decent job of generating at least the base code that allows you to then, you know, you then need to, to tweak it and make it your own. Um, but and there are there are some risks that you have to think about when you're when you're using especially an open tool, but um, but yeah, from a developer perspective, it, it really does it saves you time, right? I mean, pure and simple, and then gives you that that opportunity to um, to think more about about better ways to enhance your user experience and customer experience. And Sarah, let me ask you, like, do yeah. you think like let's go back to twenty years ago, the coding tools that were mm -hmm. available? If you were to fast forward somebody from twenty years ago, to would they be upset at how easy it is for us today? <laughs> no, not at all. Yeah, yeah. And that's I mean, and I think that's the point, right? Is 100%. is is that we we all we get so nervous and freaked out but you know it, it'd be like oh my gosh it, you know there's a little bit of a grumpy old man like back in my day we didn't <laughs> need these fancy tools but the you know that's what i think is really exciting is is that as we grow we're growing faster and faster and faster and faster but let's not let's stop thinking about the the the, the, the negative ramifications quite so much. We right. do need to be sure we're paying attention to that, but less focus, more focus on like, wow, this is, look at how amazing this is. That's where I want to get yeah. excited about. Well, and I think also to, to that point, thinking about there are, there are things that we should be concerned about, but not everything, right? So I think focus right. on where, where do we want to put that concern? And to me, it's things like, you know, from a, a developer perspective um, in, you know, open models of, of uh, generative AI tools, people were finding, you know, because generative AI can hallucinate, right? They were finding um, NPM packages that were, that didn't actually exist. So they were then creating them and adding malware to them, right? Those are the things that, that kind of thing, 
hundred percent we should be worried about. We should be thinking about, we should mitigate, try to mitigate that risk as much as possible. When it comes to, is this going to take a developer's job? The answer is absolutely not. The answer is how does a developer evolve with the technology that exists today? And that actually isn't a question that's just being posed because of generative AI. That's a question that we're posed, that's posed all the time because as you mentioned, technology is rapidly changing all the time. Yeah, we're the problem, not them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I would like to stay a bit on that uh, aspect a bit more, Sarah. And then I know there will be there will be some challenges for the developers to use these AI tools in such and such a way. Uh, may, maybe you want to briefly talk a bit about that. I know things are getting better for a period of sure. time, and things will get better. But currently, are there any challenges that are being faced when developers are using these tools? And sure. I mean, I think you need to understand. You need to understand what the tool is that you're using. I think you need to understand if there are, um, you know, where, where, where the log, large language model is, right, and, mm -hmm. and how it's being trained. Um, I think that those are the kinds of things that um, we should be mindful of. I think um, there are, I, I think that you can use, you can leverage the way I would recommend developers using it today. I would use it as a, as a starting point, right? You know, use it or use it to check code as long as that's not proprietary code. That's a huge thing that's, you know, you don't want to put proprietary code out there that could be then consumed and, and shared out in, in other ways. So you have to think about those kinds of things. But if you're, if you're just writing a simple, you know, you, you want a, a simple web app, right? Or a, just a simple um, component, you want mm -hmm. to test that, run it through a chat GPT or similar kind of tool. Mm -hmm. um, and then learn from there, right? I think we need to think about how, where in, in the development process we bring in a generative AI tool. Um, and so those are the kinds of things to think about. And it doesn't, again, to Dave's point, not everything is doom and gloom, right? It's just making sure that we're mindful of, of the tool that we're using, where the LLM comes from, how it's being trained, you know, and that we're not sharing anything that we wouldn't otherwise want out there. Um, Beautifully, well, very well said. Now coming back to you, Dave, as a product evangelist, I know you've been working on a lot of these tools, a lot of these innovative AI tools. What do you think, or maybe could you share some insights on how customer experience, how these tools that, that when you're using, how you can enhance the customer experience? Yeah, it, it, it's, it, it basically comes down to one very simple statement. Does it work, right? Mm -hmm. Because I mean, I can call a I can call a company and it, I could the the phone system could deliver me to the uh, person who has worked there for fifteen years and knows everything about every policy and oh I know exactly I've seen this before and boom I'm done and the customer experience is amazing then the same call could get routed to the person who's worked there for two weeks and I spend an hour and a half on the phone I don't get my problem resolved I have to call back three different times it doesn't work. That's human beings. It's the same thing with the AI and the self-service, right? Does it work? And if it works, we're going to use it. We That bottom line, um, I think most people, even for me, as you can tell, I'm a little bit introverted. I'm, I'm not big on, <laughs> no. Uh, uh, even me as, a, as an extreme extrovert, I would rather not talk to a human being um, when I have an issue, if I can have a chat with my internet service provider and this can fix the problem and I, it's all done without interacting with a human, great. That's a time saver on my part and leave that that more complex issue for the agent who knows what they're doing. Um, and so that that to me is the real crux of everything that we're doing with AI. What I'm talking about from a customer perspective and what Sarah is talking about from a developer and web web perspective, does it work? If can I load a web app into chat GPT and build it for me? It's like, okay, why wouldn't I use that? That I would be silly to not use that. But if it doesn't work, those developers lose confidence in chat GPT. They, we don't really like to spend a lot of time figuring out why it didn't work. We just kind of say, okay, I've been burned once and I don't know if I really want to go through that. And I think that's probably the biggest challenge for customers using AI based technology is it, we, we all love those little chat messages that pop up in the bottom right hand corner of every web page that we come to. How can I help you? Right. And, 
how many of us go, boy, I'd sure like to give that a try. No, most of the time we we don't because a lot of us are missing that uh, confidence in that. So we as providers of AI need to spend a lot more time building that consumer confidence in our products um, so that we do trust them. But it will it will come around if they start to work. You know, it's it's just like any other system. You know, you could talk about sports, you could talk about games. If the if the tactic works, other people will start to use it, and people will become more confident in it. And that's really what our what our overall goal should be. Does it work? And if not, we need to make it work. And I think the interesting thing there, Dave, is that that especially in a post COVID world, right, our reliance on technology is is so much more. It was, we're so much more sophisticated than we were even four years ago, right? Mm-hmm. And things that were uh, <clears throat> activities that were once something you did in person, now people are expecting to have that experience in a digital format of some kind. And so I think that to your point about, about having customer confidence in your technology, there is this, um, if it doesn't work right away, there's an ex- there used to be this kind of like, ah, you know what, it's kind of a cool thing, I'll give it a shot. If it doesn't work now, they're saying, well, wait a minute, why isn't this working? It should work. It's, you know, and and I personally had something similar to that. Last year I was working with a, a piece of software and, and had a question for the, the people who were, had built it. And I typed in the chat bot and it gave me the most ridiculous responses known to man. Mm-hmm. And I found myself really irritated because I'm like, you know what? It should just work, right? It's 2023 at the time. I'm like, how is it possible that this doesn't? And so I think as users become more reliant reliant on it, their patience for something not working is, or or having a subpar experience is, it's just not there, right? And so Mm -hmm. we have to earn that by making sure that the experiences we're building do, they, they deliver on the promise of, of ease of use and helping aid in productivity as opposed to adding more time to their, to their busy day. Right. Yeah. It can't, it can't just be a party trick. Right. Exactly. And that's what, yeah. that's what I laugh about the, you know, the Amazon echoes and the Google assistants and things like that. We all went out and bought those smart, smart speakers for our houses. Right. And that, you know, we got 10 of them and literally like the only thing that they get used for is my granddaughter plays songs from frozen on it. Right. That's, <laughs> That's that's it, and and the promise of that never really equated th- th- what we wanted to get out of it. But now we're talking, we're, we're we're the stakes are much higher. Now right. we're talking about commerce c- continue to exist based on AI. We're talking about taking vast swatches of unstructured data and turning it into real intelligence. So the stakes are much much higher now in before before the uh, the smart speaker revolution, and so that's. That's why we have to be careful. We have to be ethical, but we have to also continue to make it better. And and even us, if I'm looking at it through a lens of being a customer, um, I have to try those things. When I go to a website, I have to say, you know what? All right, yep. I'm going to give it a shot and yep. see if you can answer my question. And I'd rather be pleasantly surprised than frustrated, but doesn't mean it always works and but they are getting better but we also as consumers have to continue to to we have to continue to try to put these things through the the paces so that we can make them better beautiful beautiful so i think at this juncture maybe i want to take a bit of a uh, diversion maybe i want to go into the aspect of i know these are great tools out there great innovations happening and we know that how on the development side of these tools, there is a lot of efforts being put and on the consumption side of the things, how these are being used. Now, I want a bit to focus a bit on to see how these innovative AI tools can realistically improve the experiences of certain populations, right? I think this is where you initially touched upon, right? Like Sarah, about uh, yeah. uh, maybe ranging from inclusive PPT to accessibility and other aspects. We want to talk a few words about how realistically we can improve the experiences of certain range of populations. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think when you think about how we can we can leverage AI to learn more about our customers in general, right? right? And the more you know about your customers or users, uh, you know, and I'm talking from an application perspective, whether it's a website or desktop application, the more insights you have into those people and their behaviors and their um it it allows us to to better build for them, right? The the interesting thing is, you know, 
user testing is something everybody should be doing all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, AI allows you to, um, to, to user test without, you know, kind of have a constant user test. You'll find sometimes that people are using your applications in ways you never intended. So that's one area, right, where you can leverage those insights. But you can also find perhaps that people aren't able to do the things that you think they they can or should be doing. Um, when we talk about inclusive design for, for, for software, um, accessibility is one part of that, right? But there are um, there are other uh, other aspects of inclusive design as well. You know, it could be localization. It could be um, uh, you know your visuals. It could be there are a lot of different things. But to take for example a form, right? If you're filling having somebody fill out a form. Um, and you come from a, um, you know, maybe a North American country where last names are very short, right? Mm -hmm. um, you could not have, potentially not have enough room in your form for somebody to put their entire name. That is not an inclusive design, right? And you might start to see that if you see people dropping off in certain places. Um, having a form that times out too quickly, right? If English, if you're, if you haven't localized and you see, start to see that you have um, you have customers coming from, from different regions and different parts of the world where English isn't their first language, or perhaps um, you have somebody who has broken their arm, right? <laughs> and, you know, so you don't have forms, but you, by understanding and leveraging AI to find those insights, you can then fix some of those and provide a more optimal journey for your, for your customers and your users. Um, and then, you know, I had touched upon it a little as well. When you think about unconscious bias, being able to identify that, um, you know, unconscious bias, by definition, is something we don't know that we have, right? So, um, you know, by by being able to, um, you can leverage AI tools, and there are different tools out there, you know, some uh, open source and some paid tools that allow you to actually uh, analyze and scrutinize your, your code and your applications to, to see where that unkind, unconscious bias might exist. And that to me is really compelling, especially when we think about the fact that, you know, going back to the idea that, that for the most part, um, you know, digital experiences are in many cases replacing that initial first human interaction. So the more the more empathetic we can be in the in the code that we're writing and the experience we're delivering, obviously the better experience it's going to be across the board. Sarah, I am 100% sure that I do not have unconscious bias. So <laughs> I'm, I'm positive. <laughs> so maybe I think to continue the conversation, right, Dave, on the customer contact center space, like where you are coming in from, your experience that comes in from, how do you see these being handled? with all these AI innovation. Yeah, so the, you know, like we've talked about, the speed is a big part of context center success, right? The faster you can handle one interaction with a customer, the the faster you can get to the next one, right? And and if your speed is lower, you need you need fewer resources to do the same amount of work. It's it's a it's what we call an Erlang calculation in our in our world. Um, and the so a lot of the AI innovations that have been focused on the context in the world have been specifically about that. How can we so Here's a here's a common example in the context center world. Every time you call into a a your bank or you know an organization and you talk to an agent, as soon as you're done with that agent, the agent has to tell their phone, "Don't send me any more calls because I need to notate the account." Right. So they Sarah called in and had questions about how to use the product, and she also was curious about how much it would be to add on. So that if the next time Sarah calls in. Uh, the the, net, the other agent can review her interactions and see, uh, here's a customer history, and I kind of know what's going on. That's always, I mean, since the very first phone call I took in 1997, that's the way it's been done. Now, AI can take a recording of the call, take that record, transcribe that recording, feed it through a, in a summarization, an AI summarization tool, and we can automatically summarize that call and notate the account without the agent needing to do any of that work. Now, it's funny because we all think, oh my gosh, that's a total win-win scenario because the agent is on to the next call and the summarization is spelled perfectly and there's no <laughs> grammatical errors and, and everything is captured. But there's actually a drawback to that too because that, that process of notating the account is also what gets that human being a mental break before taking the next call. Because if you've never worked in a contact center before as an agent, it's a mind-numbingly 
boring uh, existence sometimes. Mm-hmm. And that mental break, that even that 30 seconds before the next call gives you a chance to kind of refocus and breathe. But if boom, the next call, boom, the next call, boom, the next call, we're going to be right back where we started with this process. So we're AI is making those calls go more quickly. So maybe we teach the agents to spend a little bit more time with the customer, show a little bit more empathy, show a little bit more humanity to them. And the customer walks away and says, oh, that was great. And the agent feels like they have a chance to breathe a little bit. So those are the kind of innovations we're seeing rapidly come into the context in a space. It's all about shortening the length of these interactions so we can we can process them more quickly. But uh, the, the summarization is huge in the context mm-hmm. in our industry. That's what we're that's what we're seeing a lot of right now. And Dave, in the, in the summarization, do you normally put, you know, this customer was audibly upset, right? You know, because you're not going to be able to to access that with or have that with from an AI perspective, at least not today. Right. Um, yeah. You know, I'm curious how how do how do you solve how would you solve for that today for something like that? Well, generally, based on my experience, we, we were often trained not to really try and put just just the facts, ma'am. Yeah, like, gotcha. Right. It's it's yeah. uh, you know just just the facts. But you know, a human being can't help but put like she screamed at me for an hour. Right. Th- those kind <laughs> right. of things in in yeah. the uh, in in the in the in the summarization. So yeah, but there are other tools available that are enabling that. So we can do things like sentiment analysis of right. the interaction. Yeah. Yes. There yeah. is speech, speech energy. There is, there's a full transcription of the call. So if we do need to go back, right, there's, there's a number of tools. So the summarization may not necessarily capture that, but the overall, there are other tools that are built into where I can say, show me every call from yesterday where somebody was really, really upset. And you, you can see that, right? So right. We, we, we mitigate that a little bit through some different areas and technology, but you're right. The summarization, it's not always going to capture, but that's not always the reason we did it. The reason we did it was to make sure that the next person knew what happened on that call, regardless yeah. Yeah. of their emotion and intent. Yeah. And interesting. Isn't it great though, how, how voice to text also has come such a long way. I have a, a friend who years ago when voice to text was a new thing, even just on her phone, right. You know, she, mm-hmm. she was, she lived on the West coast. Uh, her boss was on the East coast and he had texted her or messaged her early in the morning, her time. And she said, I'll get back to you in a minute. She said, and I, I'm going to hop in the shower real quick. And it came out, I'm roller skating in the shower. And, <laughs> you know, and, and obviously, you know, that was, those were earlier days, but it's amazing to see how far we've come even from that, you know? So when yes. we talk about, we talk about AI and where we are today with generative AI, it, like you said, five, 10 years from now, the conversation might be even, well, it will be very different. And, and there will probably be some things that we laugh about then, like clearly not roller skating in the shower, but hopping in the shower. <laughs> and, and I think about, you know, in all the futuristic movies that you see, you know, the person comes home from work sets their keys on the table and then says lights and all the lights magically turn on. <laughs> we, we can do that today. But my question is nobody wants to talk out loud to these things, right? Nobody wants to stand in a crowded square with their phone and then say, <laughs> you know, give me a summarization of why the Notre Dame cathedral is we we're still very private with that information. And that's see, to me, that's going to be where this eventually evolves yeah, is yeah. Uh, how how we can communicate with AI without necessarily speaking it out, out loud into the universe. Right, right. I think that that is where I think we are heading. Right. I think how we can privatize this, or or maybe privacy oriented, or how in safe spaces how you can handle right. these things. Right. Yeah. I know very interesting conversation. Uh, I would like to come to the important. Uh, uh, question of the conversation generally I do in the podcast. I think first maybe I'll go to you, Dave. A million dollar or a billion dollar question of uh, what I try to ask my guests is about the differentiation factor. I know there is a lot of competition out there yep. with Calabi. What do you think is a differentiation factor or what is the uniqueness? Maybe in one word, one sentence, one phrase yeah. or whatever. <laughs> This, this is completely the antithesis of the entire conversation that we've had. But um, the differentiator for us is our human beings, right? Mm-hmm. The, the, the way we can empathize, we can understand with the way we respond, the way we work with our customers. Um, yes, we try to give these amazing technological tools that, that are great with the button you click or the, the thing that happens in the background. But um, so much of the 
the the acquisition process of bringing in customers is still so human driven and that's our differentiator is how we train how we respond how we listen um you know and i know this does not fit in an ai conversation for a <laughs> podcast but that's the answer for us is that we want to give great technology but behind that technology is a really awesome set of people who really know how to listen and 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 have experience in this field to know how to handle the next scenario that pops up and be ready for that. Beautiful. Amazing. Amazing. Coming over to you, uh, Sarah, like again, the same question. What right. is that one word or one sentence or one uniqueness? From right. Well, you know, I, I would also was thinking human side, right? You know, ours, right. Is, ours is the human side of software with, um, with a spirit of experimentation, right? So from a, the, 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 the people behind what we're doing are thinking about ethics and AI, and they're thinking about um, the user experience and, and not just our user experience, but the user experience for the people who are then using the tools that are built with our, with our tools, right? Um, and, and being able to, to provide next generation technology Right for um, in in a way that again is safe and ethical and um, and really leaning into the the value proposition that we make things easier for our developers and and IT pros we make it easier for marketing people who are leveraging our our CMS um, and we make them far more productive right and so again I love your answer Dave because the, the human side of software is is near and dear to my heart. Um and Sorry, so, it kind of sounds like I stole your answer. I apologize. You did, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I think the, the beauty of that is that that it still can be a unique differentiator for both of us, right? Because yes. because there is and that that when we go back to the juxtaposition between AI which is it is a little bit more well it's very more much more robotic and humans, humans are so unique, right? And so mm -hmm. the, the value proposition can be the same um, for, for both sides of, of the house. And then how we leverage that non-empathetic technology to be more empathetic is a truly a, a, a key differentiator. And it sounds like for both of us, Dave. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. So I, I completely echo with your thoughts like that in non-empathetic technology, how it can make it even more competitive, it can make it much more humane and make it much more human experience. So, you know, we are getting uh, to the end of the conversation, but any key takeaways or insights that you would like to provide to our audience out there, uh, Sarah, maybe I'll go first with you. I mean, I think I'll go back to, to what Dave said. I'm gonna steal one of your answers, Dave, is that it was, uh, we're in a really exciting time, right? And the, the benefits that, um, that we will see as, as a global society from AI, I think are, are things that we can't even at this point quantify. Um, there are risks and I think that we need to be mindful of those, but it shouldn't stop, <clears throat> shouldn't stop experimentation. It shouldn't stop us from, from trying to build new things. And we should evolve as a species, we should evolve as developers uh, on my side, at least of the house, uh, to find different ways to, to not just implement the technology and go beyond the hype, right? So, you know, generative AI is the, the buzz phrase right now, but AI, as I mentioned before, it's been around 75 years. It was the, uh, I don't know if you guys are aware of this, you probably are, but the Dartmouth Summer Research Project on AI conference where the, the um, logic theorist was presented, that was 75 years ago, right? So this is not a new concept and we should be, um, it's just such an exciting time to see if we take the hype out of out of things and say we've democratized AI, right? The the citizen developer, the citizens of the world can use AI in some way, shape, or form. Our job is then to say how can we harness that to make this a world a better place to live in? How can we make our apps more accessible? How can we make our apps more inclusive? And how can we um, yeah? How can we make everybody more productive and in the end happier? So um, yeah, I, I mean there's a lot of opportunity. Yeah, great piece of advice there, right? How, how can we make everybody uh, like more inclusive and make yeah. it more easier for everybody to develop, uh, like provide the same opportunities and make it much more easier to address the problems out there, I think, and in leveraging the human experience here. Absolutely, yeah. Fun. And over to you, uh, Dave, any closing remarks or key insights that you could provide 
to our audience that I know. No, I honestly, Sarah said it so well, and I'll, I'll I'll just take what she said even a step further. What I look for is the exciting things of AI that we we necessarily haven't thought of yet, right? The mm -hmm. things that I could try to speculate, but. The, we haven't thought of them yet because we haven't thought of them yet. Right. That's, that's the reason why, but I, what I, what I'm really looking forward to is, you know, from a personal perspective, how AI can help me be more, more productive that how I'm, I'm still blown away at the fact that Google maps can tell me how long it's going to take me to get somewhere. And it it's right. Like, how can it do that? Right. And that's been around for a while. That's it's still, that still blows me away. But what's really exciting is the next phases of AI where we solve things like how to get water to communities that don't have water. How do we capture the, the watershed from a topographical map and put things in the right places from AI? Just this insane amount of data that's out there. How do we logistically get food from one area of the world to another to, to you know, make populations uh, healthier? Those Those are things that probably are already happening. And I'm sure there's somebody listening going, oh, shh, don't say that. That's our idea, <laughs> right? But those are the things that I'm really excited about from a humanity perspective. And as much as the movie, The Terminator, scared us all about AI, um, I think that the, 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 the beautiful thing about the movie Terminator and Skynet is that it taught us that from the very beginning, we need to be ethical with our yes. AI. Um, and that's, that's, I'm, I'm actually really glad that it happened that way, because I don't think if we weren't scared going into this thing, I don't think that we might've built some of the guardrails that are perhaps keeping AI in check a little bit. And we may get, we may, you know, again, we may listen to this podcast in 10 years and go, well, we were so wrong, but uh, <laughs> the, 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 that's the exciting thing for me is, is kind of the next thing that we haven't thought of yet. I think being mindful of that, though, you know, when you go back to ethical AI, you know, there, there are, I, I think there are a lot of opportunities for us to continue to think about um, making sure those can, that we continue to build the guardrails and that we keep checks and balances on those guardrails. There are a lot of, um, a lot of laws and regulations already in place, right, which, um, which is pretty amazing when you think about how new um, AI, I said, is obviously not new, but but the way that we're consuming it and leveraging it is absolutely new, right? And so to be able to have these different regulations in place to, to help help make sure that we are um, that we remain ethical is, is pretty phenomenal. And I don't think you're wrong, Dave. I think we're gonna be, um, yeah. I, I think in five years, if you and I hopped back on this <laughs> podcast, uh, we, we would probably be saying really glad we continue to think about that from an ethics perspective. Mm -hmm. And and I think there are enough people who are thinking about it on a regular basis that they're going to find all the, you know, the loopholes here and there. Um, and, I and I will still be blown away by Google Maps. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah me years. too. I know I'm, I'm one of those ones who used to have like an atlas, you know. <laughs> like yeah, I think nowadays we can't even... We, we don't put our mind for minimal things, right? And get in the car and just press the button and it'll take you where it has to be. Right. So, right. So those are yeah. the things that we can use it for the purposes that we need. You know, it's funny, speaking along those lines, I had a girlfriend coming out down to visit. I live in Florida. She's in Canada. And she landed in the States and her phone wasn't working. And she said the first thing she thought of is, <laughs> oh, my gosh how am I going to get a hold of Sarah? Like, what am I going to do? And I was, and we both started laughing because there was a time not that long ago that, you know, she wasn't going to call me on a pay, you know, what is she going to call me from a pay phone? If I'm in my yeah. car, there's no way to do that. And so, you know, we kind of had to readjust our brains to think about, Oh, how do we, how do we interact in a world where we don't have that connectivity? And I think that that's going to be one thing that we should all be mindful of, even yeah. as AI makes us more productive. If something goes down, we should not have it completely replace our ability to think and interact uh, right. with, with people moving forward. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is where the human element stays. That is where I keep saying that humans can't be replaceable. Whatever yeah. you might do, yeah. you will still need to be human, need to be there. And a lot of things are dependent. Great having this conversation with both of you. I really loved it. Thank you. That was wonderful. It was great yes. to talk to both of you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. All right. So that concludes a dynamic and insightful episode 85 of Extra AI. Firstly, I would like to say a huge thank you to our roundtable guests, Sarah Hertz and Dave Hoekstra, 
for their invaluable contributions today. Their expertise in leveraging AI to enhance customer experiences and drive business modernization has provided us with a wealth of knowledge and practical insights. And we also want to thank you all, our audience, and deepest gratitude to you for joining us in this engaging discussion. Your interest and participation are what makes Extra AI a hub for learning about the latest trends and technologies in AI. As always, I will be tagging our guests, Sarah Hertz and Dave Hotstra, on the LinkedIn post. If you have any further questions, you can directly reach out to them, or you can alternatively reach out to me, Raghu Banda, on LinkedIn, and I can put you in touch with them. You can also reach out to me on my other social media channels, like my Twitter or X handle, Akte Banda, or of course, you can also go to our website, extraai.com, xtraai.com, where you can find humongous amount of other episodes in the context of AI in the domain of AI. So looking ahead, make sure that you stay glued to Extra AI for our next episode, where we will dive into the world of consulting and advisory in the age of AI. It's said to be another enlightening discussion, exploring how AI is transforming the consulting industry and what it means for businesses and advisors alike. Of course, if you haven't subscribed to the Extra AI podcast yet, we encourage you to do so now. This way, you won't miss any of our upcoming episodes, which are filled with expert insights and forward-thinking discussions. Thank you once again for tuning in, and we look forward to having you with us for the next time on Extra AI. Happy predicting the future with AI technologies. And this is your host, Raghu Banda, signing off. Thank you, and bye-bye now.